This is the, the perennial Sabi River. Um, you know, it's been flowing like this for, for aeons. And uh, we have a, a responsibility to, as custodians of South Africa's wildlife heritage, to uphold this heritage and, and ensure its protection. This is Andrew Parker's office, the birthplace of wildlife tourism in South Africa. Sabi Sand is the country's oldest private reserve. And on any given day, guests are bound to see some of Africa's big five. Water buffalo, elephants, and of course, rhino. But Parker's job as a conservationist is coming with increasing costs. You know, if we can't save one of the big five, one of Africa's most charismatic species, what chance have we of, of protecting the smaller, less charismatic, more vulnerable species? Poaching is driving up the price of live rhino, as more and more resources are devoted to its protection. In Asia, a growing middle class with more disposable income is fueling an increase in demand for rhino horn. Consumers incorrectly believe the horns have medicinal properties. And with the rising demand, the cost of protecting rhinos is rising too. As much as we increase the risk, all it'll do is it'll drive up the price of the horn. It, it'll raise the stakes. The poachers will become more organized, will be better prepared to fight their way in and their way out. So the stakes will just continue to climb and the cost of protecting rhino will become huge and, and, and perhaps unaffordable for a lot of, a lot of rhino owners. Sabi Sand is now spending 50% of its annual maintenance budget on security as this pristine patch of African bush becomes the front line in the fight to save the rhino. There's no question that this is a counterinsurgency war. Parker says he's tried just about everything to keep the rhinos on his reserve safe. We have adopted a canine unit using dogs. We've tried contaminating the horns of the rhinos in, in an effort to try and reduce the reward. But the battles continue to be won by increasingly sophisticated criminal syndicates. Uh, you know, the conservation areas in South Africa have been sheltered against organized crime. And uh, I think they caught us napping, quite, quite honestly. I think we were caught unprepared. Um, the level of sophistication that the, the, the criminal syndicates are displaying in terms of their tactics uh, is proving overwhelming from a law enforcement perspective. From 83 rhinos poached in 2008 to 448 dead in 2011 to this year, when it's estimated 1,000 rhinos will be slaughtered for their horn, according to the South African government. The real concern is that this is one day probably the only place that you'll see them, if, if something doesn't change quite quickly. Julian Radamere is author of Killing for Profit, a look into the illegal trade. Um, I think the rhino trade is getting significantly worse. Uh, we're seeing poaching numbers go through the roof. In the last uh, four years, we've lost more than 2,200 rhino. Um, that is uh, seven times the number that we lost in the preceding 27 years. This is about sophisticated criminal networks, isn't it? No, incredibly sophisticated criminal networks, um, highly ingenious criminal networks who are adept at finding their way around regulations and loopholes. Extremely dangerous syndicates too. You know, these are people who are prepared to kill and die in some cases for a few kilograms of rhino horn. For the syndicate bosses, there is very low risk. Um, the people who are paying the price, the people who are taking all the risks, are the poachers that are being recruited. We've had cases recently where three Mozambican poachers were sentenced to 16 years in prison and they were paid uh, around $600 for a rhino that they were supposed to kill and get, get the horns from. So the Africans are at the front line essentially, and, and what is the impact on local villages then? Well, I think if you travel to the villages in southern Mozambique, um, they're incredibly poverty-stricken villages, there are very, very few opportunities there, and people are offered an incredibly stark choice. They can either cross through the Kruger illegally, try and find work in Johannesburg and get paid a pittance, or they can walk into Kruger, find a rhino, poach it, and hand the horns over to, to a syndicate. And there's a steady stream of people waiting to be recruited who are essentially cannon fodder for these, for these syndicates. How do you see this playing out? I think it's going to get very much worse before it gets any better. Um, at the moment, we're losing the war. And as we've seen in the past, if you look at what happened with the black rhino population from the 1960s to, to the mid-1990s, uh, in the 1960s, there were roughly 200,000 black rhino in Africa. By the mid-90s, that had been reduced to a population of just over 2,000. Uh, when, the, when the slide begins, it happens quite rapidly and quite spectacularly. And the concern in South Africa is that the, the tipping point when breeding rates are outstripped by poaching uh, could be reached as early as 2015.
were on the door were the first one. Tribal leader Sani Ostmuna's village sits just three kilometers from the gates of Sabi Sand. When rhino poachers came through two weeks ago, community members chased them away. It's a story that conservationist Andrew Parker knows needs to be repeated. We have to find ways to include communities and really transfer meaningful benefits to communities from conservation so that, so that they too have something to lose if, if our heritage goes down the drain. But in South Africa, unemployment is high. In the 27 communities surrounding Sabi Sand, just one in eight villages has a job. There's no question that 20 years ago in South Africa, we should have been including communities as equity stakeholders in the value chain. Uh, you know, if that was the case, if the communities had a, had a real and direct vested interest in the future of wildlife in South Africa, it's very unlikely that the criminal syndicates would have been able to, to gain a foothold uh, in, in South Africa and be able to, to uh, carry out the crimes that they are carrying out at the moment. Now Parker says his reserve is in a race to include communities in the conservation economy. But author Julian Rademeyer says in South Africa, it isn't an easy sell. There's a disconnect in Vietnam between the consumers and the product that they're using. But there's also sometimes a disconnect between the local villages that live, perhaps, or border some of these national parks. And they often are used to kill the rhinos. I think in South Africa it plays into so many social issues. It touches on issues of land, land rights. It touch, touches on issues of, of poverty. Um, you have cases, and you know, in South Africa, Game farming and farming rhinos has been seen for so long as almost a, you know, a, a wealthy white enterprise um, that local villages are excluded. People you know, had been under apartheid, for instance, had been removed from areas to make way for, for game farms and, and some of our larger national parks. So there are real issues there. Um, and I think, I think that is an incredible challenge. How do you include those communities? You know, the same extends to, to Mozambique. How do you include the communities in southern Mozambique? How do you make them benefit from a place like Kruger? Because where they're sitting, all they see is this immense wealth across the border that means absolutely nothing to them. At Sabi Sand, it starts with increasing employment opportunities inside the park for community members like Rex and Ntamane. Where we can go, there's nowhere else. We need to support uh, tourism. And the tourism owners, they have to to put something into the community and it makes it work. We need to create a relationship in short. Beyond jobs, that relationship also means investing in schools and social programs outside of the reserve. As a community leader, we have to save the rhino, to save our people for their job and the benefit of money flowing back into the community. If we don't do that, we, where all the people will go? On the western perimeter of the reserve, Parker takes us to a spot he watches closely. One of our key suspects in the fight against rhino poaching uh, lives in this village, um, yet uh, our jurisdiction as a law enforcement agency stops at the fence, so we have no jurisdiction legally to go beyond this fence. We can't go into this community and arrest him. You know, increasingly conservation areas in South Africa and, and even across the rest of Africa are becoming islands embedded in a, a sea of rural poverty. Obviously, there's a lot of people from these villages that are employed in, in the reserves, but it's more than employment. You know, it's, uh, I think we need to give the people of Africa a stake in conservation. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's critical if we are to combat rhino poaching or any kind of poaching for that, for that matter. Winning hearts and minds in the war to save Africa's rhinos.